a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is the 1st of November 2017, some kind of a Roman Catholic devilish holiday of all saints or whatever. One day after they, of course, celebrated Halloween, and in Germany, for the very first time in 500 years, the Reformation Day was an official holiday. The shops were closed, nobody had to work yesterday, except for the people who always have to work, but the normal people could just take a day off. And they, quote-unquote, celebrated Reformation Day in Germany yesterday. Yeah. I saw a little bit on the television, and I can tell you if Martin Luther had to be witness of any of those things that were going on yesterday there, he, if he could, would jump out of his grave and stone them all, really. What they did of his Reformation Day is an nothing, it's, it's nothing more and nothing less but pure abomination. Anyway, today on the 1st of November 2017, I'm going to continue reading in this book, the wonderful book, The Legacy of Martin Luther Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. And um, we are going to continue where we left off last time, that is on the, uh, in the middle of page 294. And this video, by the way, is called uh, as, uh, the same name as I called a German video in the readings. It is called, But What Are Prayer and God's Word to the Pope? <laughs> and we will answer during this reading this question too. So, let me just go a little bit back. <coughs> we went uh, to page 294 and on the second paragraph, for the people who are going to read along in their books, Luther's work, volume 41, Church and Ministry, uh, uh, volume 3, or chapter 3, or whatever you're going to call that, uh, on page 294, in the middle of the page, we're going to continue our sixth reading today of this wonderful book that Martin Luther wrote as his legacy, because it was this book that was published the same day the Council, the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent opened in 1545. And on the same day, Martin Luther published this book, and this was the last book he ever published. And we are coming or going into that a little bit deeper during the reading, at the end of the reading, for sure, too. So I'm going to continue now on page 294. A chancellor in Mainz named Martin Meyer wrote, and there comes a little footnote here, that we have to go into, because it says um, that uh, Meyer's letter is dated the August of 31st, 1541. 1451, sorry. Luther had discussed the correspondence in 1537. Is this about the right footnote? Yeah, this is the right footnote. Uh, in 1537, so eight years before, when he edited the work of a Dominion monk, Giovanni Nani, on the state of Christendom during the Turkish threat in 1481. A Turkish threat that was when Islam, when the Turks were standing at the doors at, or, or the walls at Vienna. And um, by that, of course, threatening to overthrow the Habsburgs, who are the Catholic fasthold of the Roman Empire. Okay? So a chancellor in Mainz named Martin Meyer wrote, and we just read, that was on the 31st of August, 1451, to Aeneas Silvius, later called Pope Pius II. And between brackets we read, Meyer had been a close companion of Silvius, while Silvius was away from, the, uh, from Rome at the court of Emperor Frederick III in Germany for several years. And there we go into another footnote that says that Antichrist Pope Pius II had been secretary in 1432 to the Bishop of Fermo, who attended the Council of Basel. 
Frederick III hired him as secretary in 1442. Close brackets and complained <coughs> and complained that the Pope was burdening and plundering the convents with anates and pallia. <laughs> the proud hypocrites answered him, saying, among many other wicked cutting things that Germany deserved to bear such a load because the Pope had bestowed the Roman Empire upon the Germans, and the Pope had to have a great deal of money so that they could prevent the Emperor from overcoming France or France overcoming England. Just look at these desperate rascals and scoundrels. Look at what they have in mind at their, and at their secret intention, namely, to keep the two sovereigns at odds and in such a position that they can back now the one, now the other, as the wind blows. Meanwhile, they are safe from the beasts and have no need to fear either reformation or counsel. Now, I think this little sentence needs a little bit more explanation. Just look at these desperate rascals and scoundrels. Look at what they have in mind and at their secret intention. So we are speaking about the Pope, the Antichrist and the Roman Curia. These desperate rascals and scoundrels. They have in their mind to keep the two sovereigns, and we are speaking here about Emperor Charles V and about the common uh, current ruling king of France that we addressed already earlier. I forgot his name for the moment. Forgive me that. I cannot keep everything in my little head. To keep those two at odds because as long as they keep the emperor of the Holy Roman, Emper uh, of the Holy Roman Empire busy with quarrels with the king of France they will not turn to the Reformation, and they will not turn to ask for a council, because they are busy otherwise. They have been misled. That's what it's all about. The Roman Catholic Church keeps the Emperor and the King of France busy with each other, and by that they will not take care of the open questions they have with them. By that the Roman papacy does not have to deal with the Reformation and does not have to deal with the council that even the German emperor wanted. But, as we've learned, a free, a German, a Christian council was what they wanted, and that's not, of course, what the Pope wanted to give them. So as long as the Pope and the Curia keeps the Holy, uh, keeps the Holy, keeps the Roman Emperor busy with the King of France, he doesn't need to care and doesn't have to fear either the Reformation or a Council. That, and that is his fear, could maybe depose of him, as the Council of Constance did, as we read already earlier in this book, as you probably remember. Now, Martin Luther continues on the top of, two, of page 295, quote, Their deeds and history testify to this over and over again, just as in our time Antichrist Clement VII sent help before Pavia in 1525 to the French against our Emperor Charles V. And when this misfired, he wiped his snout, like the whore in Proverbs 30, verse 20, and said he had done it for the good of the emperor. Now, we have to go a little bit into what we are reading here, because it says, um, their deeds and history testify to this over and over again, just as in our time, Clement VII, so that was the successor of Leo X, and probably the precursor of uh, Paul III, sent help before Pavia in 1525 to the French against our Emperor Charles V. And here we are speaking about the famous sack of Rome. 
So when you just Google, Google the uh, information sack of Rome and you turn to Wikipedia, you will read here that the sack of Rome on, the May, on May 6th, 1527 was a military event carried out by the mutinous troops of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor at that time in Rome, then part of the Papal States. Yeah? Rome was part of the Papal States. It marked a crucial imperial victory in the conflict between Charles and the League of Cognac. Cognac in France a league that existed between 1526 and 1529 and was actually the alliance of France, Milan, Venice, Florence and the Papacy. So the Papal States, Venice, Florence and Milan together with France and the Papacy formed a league that was contrary to the actual empire, the German Empire, huh? the Holy Roman Empire of Germination, as it was called. And you can learn more of that when you go into that Wikipedia stuff, but I'm not going to uh, read more out of this. You can do your own research in history, but this is what uh, Martin Luther in this book here speaks about when he says, before Pavia to the French against our Emperor Charles. Thus, he continues, to this ridicule and hurt, Emperor Charles had to let him drum on his snout, although he was later in the year 1527 attacked in Rome and captured, but did not receive his just deserts due to the Emperor's goodness. Oh, how can a Pope do otherwise? Consider it yourself. When a desperate, wicked, cunning knave puts on the mask and name of Christ or St. Peter, and gains such an advantage that the Christians fear him and flee for the sake of the names of Christ and St. Peter, he has won and does what he likes, commits one rascality after another, particularly when God's wrath allows the devil to lift and push him along. Christ has warned us enough in Matthew 14, verse 23, that many would come in his name and say, I am the Christ. And in Matthew 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Thus the Pope too, under the mask and name of, Saint, uh, of Christ and St. Peter, has intimidated and fooled the whole world as he wanted to do. And through the devil he has put up a show of great devotion and spirituality until he has reached the point that he now raves openly and with all his might and every depravity so that there is no means to stopping him from now on. But the scoundrel Aeneas Silvius would have deserved to be set straight by the scholars. He really boasts quite proudly that the Pope should become involved in wars between kings so that he can rightfully plunder the convents. Why doesn't he look for other means, such as prayer and preaching, to reconcile the kings? But what are prayer and God's word to the Pope? He must serve his own God, the devil, Martin Luther concludes here. Very important paragraph on page 295. How can a Pope do otherwise? Consider yourself that he has to, uh, when, a, when a desperate, wicked and cunning knave puts on the mask and name of Christ or St. Peter. That's exactly what happened in 321 when Emperor Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity. That a desperate, wicked, cunning knave puts on the mask of Christ and St. Peter. That the Emperor, because the Pope calls himself the Emperor, he calls himself the Caesar, just go to Pope Pius IX says this Corsi, and you will see that he says there, the Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone fidelity and, uh, and uh, what's it called there, fidelity and obedience are due, I think that's what it calls there. The point is that, that what Martin Luther makes here is that the Pope 
puts on the mask of Christ. Now when I put on a mask of somebody else, does that make me that somebody else? No. But to the outside world, does it look to them that I am that somebody else? Yes. But when you look closely, you will see that it only is a mask. And that behind that, someone else or something else is hiding. So is the devil hiding under the mask of Christ. And he uses the man, the Pope, to achieve his goals. And Christ warned us. Christ warned us in Matthew 24, among other places, that he said that there would come many in his name and say, I am the Christ. That's why he also said in Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. How can I identify a false prophet? By measuring what he says to the word of God. And if the things that he says are not in compliance with the word of God, with the Bible, then he is a false prophet. Beware of false prophet, as Jesus Christ warned us, who come to you in sheep's clothing. Thus, he continues, the Pope too, under the mask and name of Christ and St. Peter, has intimidated and fooled the whole world. As it is said in, Revel, in the book of Revelation, that the whole world wanders after the beast, the Vatican, as he wanted to do. And through the devil he has put up a show of great devotion and spirituality. Why through the devil? Well, because in Revelation 13 it says that the dragon gave him the power. The dragon, that old serpent, also called the devil, as we can read in the Bible. He has put up a show of great devotion and spirituality until he has reached the point that he now raves openly and with all his might in every depravity so that there is no means of stopping him from now on. But the scoundrel Aeneas Silvius would have deserved to be set straight by the scholars. He really boasts quite proudly that the Pope should become involved in wars between kings so that he can rightfully plunder the convents. And not only that, he should not only come, uh, should be involved in wars between kings, that's what he does. He stirs up the one king against the other, like we've just read a little bit earlier that he stirs up the German emperor, against the French king to reach his goals. And when all is said and done, the Pope comes as the man of peace and determines the, uh, the terms for the peace. Yeah, that's what he does today too. Now Martin Luther asks the question, listen very closely, why doesn't the Pope look for other means? such as prayer and preaching to reconcile kings. Because wouldn't that be his duty if he really was who he claims he is? Wouldn't that be the duty of the vicar of Christ to reconcile kings instead of let them fight and murder and kill their people? We are speaking about the ministry of reconciliation instead of the ministry of condemnation. But we are living in the times and kingdom of the Antichrist and therefore, therefore, there is no Pope who wants to reconcile anything, who wants only to add to his own power, and therefore Martin Luther asks the question, why doesn't he look for other means such as prayer and preaching to reconcile kings. And now comes his answer. But what are prayer and God's word to the Pope? He doesn't even know the Bible. He doesn't even know the God of the Bible. So what are prayer and God's word to the Pope? He must serve his own God, the devil. Martin Luther 
continues this paragraph and concludes this paragraph. Why doesn't he look for other means, such as prayer and preaching, to reconcile the king? Why doesn't he look for biblical means to serve the conflict that he stoked in the first place? What are prayer and God's word to the Pope? Nothing. Because he must serve his own God, the devil. I find this a very, very important sentence, and that's why I call the video, But what are prayer and God's word to the Pope? And if you have a different answer than the one that Martin Luther gives here, or that I give you by reading this book, I'd like to hear it in the comment section. Would be interesting. Anyway, continue. But all this, although it is unbearable and intolerable, is still the least of it. The foremost and worst scum of all the devils in hell is that he expands such power to the point that he wants authority to establish laws and articles of faith to interpret scripture, which he never learned, does not know, and does not even wish to know, according to his own mad fancy. He wants to force the whole world to believe his teaching though he teaches nothing but pure idolatry, as we shall hear, and he destroys everything, everything that the Son of God, our Lord, gained for us with his blood. He takes away faith, he takes away Christian freedom, and true good works, and calls it in his devilish, villainous decretals, well done, and obedience to the church. And he roars as one possessed and full of devils, that what Ever is not uh, that whoever is not obedient to him and his Roman church cannot attain salvation. That's what the Pope boasts about all the time. The bull unam sanctam from Pope Boniface the Eighth of 1302, that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. So here we have it again. He roars as one possessed, and of course he is possessed by the devil, and full of devils, that whoever is not obedient to him, the Pope, and his Roman Church, cannot attain salvation. He who is obedient to him, the Pope, will be saved. The only thing that matters to him is that the whole world should be obedient and subject to him. He does not ask for obedience to God and Christ. His thought does not, this thought does not even occur to him at all. Obedience to the Pope, obedience to the worldly powers, that's it. The temporal powers that the Pope has and the spiritual powers that the Pope has. Obedience to him and to him alone, that, he says, will gain you salvation. That's not what Jesus Christ said, right? That's not what the Bible teaches, right? But that's what the Pope teaches. By the fruits you will know him. Everything the Pope teaches is 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches. He is full of devils. And whosoever is not obedient to the Pope and his Roman Church, he claims cannot attain salvation. And if you do not want my salvation, then you're going to die. Convert or die. The policy of the Roman Catholic Church from the beginning. He who is obedient will be saved, the Pope claims. The only thing that matters to him is that the whole world should be obedient and subject to him. Here we have Martin Luther writing in 1545 about the New World Order which is actually just the old world order restored, as you probably have understood by now. He who is obedient will be saved. The only thing that matters to the Pope is that the whole world should be obedient and subject to him. This is what the world today is all about. Obedience to the Pope. 
obedience to the laws of the Roman Catholic Church because their spiritual canon law is above the civil law in every country that has a concordat with Rome. In every country where the government is obedient to the Pope of Rome, you have Roman Catholic canon law instead of civil law. All civil laws must be in compliance with Roman Catholic canon law. And if you want someone really professional explaining that to you, then go to my second YouTube channel, Joggler's War on Disinformation, and you will find a video there when you, take it in, when you uh, type that into the search engine on the channel, Vatican Control Through Civil Law. You can also watch that on other channels, but I have that on my second channel uploaded. Richard Bennett, one hour, explains Vatican Control Through Civil Law. And this is exactly what Martin Luther is claiming here in 1545, for God's sake, almost 500 years ago. The only thing that matters to him, the Pope, is that the whole world should be obedient and subject to him. The restoration of the old world order global, on a global scale. That is all that matters to him. He does not ask for obedience to God and Christ because he does not even ask anything to know anything or interpret scripture because he has never learned it. He does not know and does not even wish to know what is in scripture. He does not ask for obedience to God and Christ. This thought does not even occur to him at all. It does not cross his mind because he is the Antichrist, and he wants all the worship. He is the vicar of Satan. And Satan said in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, that he wants to be worshipped. And the Pope, as the vicar of Satan, says, Worship me, and by worshipping me, you are worshipping Satan. Whether you know it or you don't, that does not matter. It does not matter. When you worship the Pope, when you give your alliance to him, you give it to the devil. Because the papacy, the first beast of Revelation 13, got its power from the dragon. Martin Luther continues, But you must under no circumstances understand the words Roman Church as meaning the true, and he says here Roman Church, and I would even like to scrap the word Roman here, so I'm going to read it the way that I understand it better. But you must under no circumstances understand the words Roman Church as meaning the true Church, especially the one that existed before the papacy, which did not wish either to accept or tolerate the papacy, as we heard in St. Gregory, uh, you remember, that we were speaking about the Bishop of Rome called St. Gregory the Great, because after him came the very first Pope, Boniface III, also, Christ certainly still has several lots and his daughters in the Roman Sodom, who are displeased with the horrible nature of the papacy. But you must instead understand it as popish, villainous, and devilish. You must understand, you must understand that the Pope uses the name of the Holy Roman Church in the most abominable, blasphemous, fashion and means his own school of scoundrels, church of whores and hermaphrodites, the devil's scum, just as before he meant, quote, free Christian German council, unquote, in a rascally way. And if you do not interpret the Pope's decretals in this way, it is impossible for you to grasp the Pope's meaning. For this is his Roman Church language, and whoever has anything to do with the Pope and Roman See must know such things, or he will certainly be cheated. He will be betrayed. He will be misled. He will be deceived. He will be lied to. He will not understand what the Pope says. 
So once again, and if you do not interpret the Pope Decretals in this way, it is impossible for you to grasp what the Pope's meaning, for this is the Roman Church language, and whoever has anything to do with the Pope and Roman See must know such things, or he will certainly be cheated. For the devil who founded the papacy speaks and works everything through the Pope and Roman See. But a Christian should not believe the devil, that murderer and father of all lies, as we can read in John chapter 8, verse 44. A Christian should not believe the devil. Now after the Pope had thus intimidated, captured, and subjected the bishops to himself, for they truly defended themselves honorably and long enough, as history testify, he tackled the worldly sovereigns with that very same text, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and could not rest until he had forced them to be under his control too. It went so far that they had to kneel before him and kiss his feet. Indeed, he even trampled on their necks with his feet, pursued them with sword and ban, robbed their lands and cities, beheaded several, the son against father, embittered one king against another, and instigated sheer conflict, murder and bloodshed among the kings, as though he were the very devil incarnate, in the hope that if the beasts, as he calls them, devoured each other, he would then be emperor, king, and lord of the world in their stead. That's what it is all about. That is why the Pope, when he lost that power, on the height of the Roman Catholic power in the end of the 15th century and beginning of the 16th century, with the starting of the Reformation, they had to do a counter-reformation to get all this power back. And when Martin Luther here said that he trampled and even stand on the ne or stood on the necks with his feet of the emperors or on the kings, remember Henry IV, the German one, with his way to Canossa. That's one of these examples. And that they were put under the ban, that they were excommunicated, and by that the whole country even was excommunicated, and all that stuff what we just read here. Very, very important sentence, so let me read it again maybe, that we can really get into it. It went so far that they had to kneel before him and kiss his feet. Indeed, he even trampled on their necks with his feet, pursued them with sword and ban, robbed their lands and cities, beheaded several, set son against father, embittered one king against another, and instigated sheer conflict, murder and bloodshed among the kings, as though he were the very devil incarnate, in the hope that if this beast devoured each other, he would then be emperor, king and lord of the world, in their stead. What I just read to you comes actually right out of the oath of the Jesuits. That didn't exist at that time, but that comes right out of that. I mean, it existed in that time, but Luther didn't know that oath. But everything the Pope did already in the years before is written down in the oath of the Jesuit order. That is their prerogative. That is their reason of existence. Yeah, To instigate Con and conflict and murder, bloodshed among the kings, as you can read in the oath. This is exactly what the Pope did when he was in power before the beginning of the 16th century and Reformation, Martin Luther kicked in. And that's what he wants to get back, of course. Then he would be emperor, king and lord of the world in their stead. He would be Pontifex Maximus. He, the Pope, would be, the Antichrist would be, lord of lords and kings of kings. This is why he boasts he is emperor and has authority to depose emperors and kings as he pleases. Yes, the Pope actually says that he is emperor. Pope Pius IX, in his discourse, he said, and I'm going to quote this, Pope Pius IX, okay, quote, The Caesar who now addresses you, and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due. 
no more, no less. That is what the own writing of the Pope says. And this is what Martin Luther refers to. This is why he boasts he is emperor and has authority to depose emperors and kings as he pleases. We were speaking about the history that the Pope says, I am above emperors, kings, councils, angels. Huh? That's what the Pope says. And Martin Luther is biblically rejecting what the Pope actually claims. But the point is that the Pope claims these things, that he has authority and depose emperors, even though that we just learned in the earlier readings that he actually got his power from the emperor. Well, now he says, I don't accept that I got the power from the emperor, I say that I got it from Christ, and therefore he uses Matthew chapter 16. And this is what Martin Luther refutes here all the time. So, th the point being, when you think about it, and this is the conclusion that you have to come to on your own, when you think about it, the, the Pope has neither the power from the Emperor, neither has he the power from Scripture. So if he has neither the power from the Emperor, the civil power, nor from Scripture, the spiritual power, what power does he have? <laughs> the same as you and me. He has no power at all. Only the power that we give to him. Only the power that Satan gives to him, but Satan has no power. And you want to see Satan run? Pick up your Bible. And when you have the Bible and you hold the Bible against Satan, he runs because he has no argument against it. That's the point. This is why Martin Luther says, the Pope boasts he is emperor and has authority to depose emperors and kings as he pleases because he is king of kings and lord of lords that's what he means that he is taking the title of our lord jesus christ although martin luther continues by the grace of god he has not yet quite succeeded in his devilish effort and will never succeed he has nevertheless often and repeatedly instigated great misfortune and heartache between the Emperor and France. And he is still doing and has done until now. If he were not a Pope but a Bishop of the true Roman Church, like St. Gregory, he would in all seriousness reconcile the two sovereigns and not to be able to rest until they were sincerely agreed, particularly because in our time it is vital for all Christianity that the great sovereigns be sincerely reconciled to each other. But this is not important to the Roman Pope. And if he does reconcile them, he has done, uh, as he has done several times, then it has all been rascally, popish and devilish, the reverse of what it seems to be. And still, of course, it's a shame that Martin Luther calls Gregory, this bishop of Rome at the time, the last bishop of Rome before the first pope, um, saint. I do not agree with that, and maybe you hear me already coming, why? <laughs> As I said earlier, Constantine baptized the true church, Christianity, no, <laughs> scrap that, Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with the original Christianity. At that moment, that Christianity that was then under the leadership of Rome was not the true biblical apostolic Christianity anymore. Therefore, the popes need to say that they are the successors of the apostles. They are Jesus Christ in succession. Because otherwise the people won't believe it. And the point is you don't have to believe anything that is outside of scripture. And the Roman Catholic Church is not the church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the earlier bishops of Rome like all the other bishops of the Catholic Church, doesn't need, doesn't need to be a Roman, can also be from the Eastern Empire, from Constantinople at that time, 
all these bishops were not bishops in the biblical sense of the biblical church. Don't forget that. Martin Luther here still does not write in the understanding. I don't say that he didn't have the understanding, but he does not write in the understanding that the Roman Catholic Church from its foundation, when we take 321 as that foundation, with the baptizing Constantine, the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity, that that was not the true church anymore. That from that moment on, when the pagan Roman Empire got baptized with Christianity, that mask is apostate. Cannot be, was not, and will never be the real, true church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, these bishops in that churches were false bishops. So you have to make a distinction, in my opinion at least, between the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church before 13, uh, 321 and after 321. Those bishops before the 4th century, I would probably agree to call, quote-unquote, Christian. But those from the time of 321 on, not anymore. And especially not when they met already at the very first council in Nicaea in 325 where they laid the foundations of the Trinity Doctrine. Yeah? So, when, with everything that Martin Luther is right, we also have here and there to consider that we cannot agree with every word of him, because when he calls Gregory here the Saint Gregory, he does that in the conviction that Saint Gregory, the Bishop of Rome in the end of the 6th century, was a legitimate bishop of the true church. And that I cannot agree with, because the true church ceased to exist. Oh, well, no, it's not, it's not that the true church ceased to exist. I should use other words to express myself. The point is that the true church was captured by Rome through infiltration by baptizing the pagan Roman Empire, and what then was continued at that church, that is the apostate church. A true church still existed. There are people that fled, people that fled Rome earlier already, people that fled Italy, people that fled France, and people like the Albigenses and the Waldenses and other people whose name we don't even know anymore today, who had the real Antiochian writings, the real true Bible all along, those were the representatives of the real true church. But those we do not read about in this book. Those we don't read about, don't read about in many books anyway. Well, you have to understand now, when Martin Luther calls here this Bishop of Rome, St. Gregory, and say that he would in all seriousness reconcile the two sovereigns, um, I do not agree with that, because also this quote-unquote St. Gregory was already a bishop in a apostate church. The Church of Rome was an apostate church from the beginning. From the moment on when Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity, that is apostate Christianity. Simple as that. There's the point you can mark it in history. Now let's see, Martin Luther continues on the bottom of page 297, and if one had at the time asked Emperor Phocas, huh, if it were his opinion that his command should establish such trash in Rome, who subjects all bishops, institutions and churches under his own control, tears up and devours everything there is, establishes new faith and doctrine, destroys Christ and Christian faith, institutes innumerable idolatries, thoroughly cheats the whole world and defrauds it with great treachery and vast sums of money and property 
who then tramples on emperors and bands, slays and persecutes them, who robs them of their lands and towns, while he ridicules them as his fools and laughs up his sleeve, <laughs> who devours their wealth and spends it with his horse and hermaphrodites, do you think that Phocas, no matter how wicked he is, would say yes to this? Indeed, perhaps he would so deal with them that they would no longer speak of the papacy and would forget about it. Forget about it, as you say in America. Huh? My earlier comment probably gives you an idea that, again, I am not in complete agreement with what Martin Luther writes here. Because even the Emperor Phocas was a wicked person, was not a Christian in the biblical sense. But Martin Luther draws a line here between the bishops of Rome and the very first Pope, as we've learned in the earlier broadcast. That was the line of 606. When then start the 1260 days, as I told you, from 606 to 1866. Martin Luther draws the line here. I draw the line much earlier. I draw the line at the latest, not the earliest, at the latest in 321. When Constantine baptized the Roman pagan empire with Christianity. There at the latest I draw the line. But I would even like to draw the line earlier. Why? Because Paul warned us that the mystery of iniquity does already work in his time. And a lot of his letters to the churches, like the letter to the Galatians, like the letter to the Corinthians, warns of them already falling in apostasy. So, we are here not even speaking about the end of the very first century. I, in my opinion, I do not think that a completely apostate-free, true Christian church had existed beyond the, very, uh, beyond the end of the very first century. That is where I would even draw the line. You know, the point is that Jesus Christ says, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in their midst, I will be. That is the true church. The bigger a congregation, a church, a denomination, whatever you want to call it, gets the easier it is to get infiltrated, the easier it gets to become apostate. And that's what happened in the past also. So I do not accept that Martin Luther... Uh, no, I do not accept... I do not agree with Martin Luther when he draws the line here at the end of the 6th century. Emperor Phocas, Emperor Maurice before that, Saint Gregory or Gregory the Great, and then Boniface III. Okay? I don't accept that line. I don't accept that point of view with Martin Luther. I, do not, I, accept, I don't agree with it, let's say that. But I don't have to agree with everything every author says, right? I don't even have to agree with everything Luther says. So here, Luther and I are in disagreement because I have a different understanding of what the true church is. And I think that if Martin Luther really had the possibility to study all this history in the same um, detail as we can do it today with the gifts that are given us today with the internet and all the electronic uh, help and everything else that we have, uh, Martin Luther would probably have come to the same conclusion. But he did not. So, this error of him is not an error that I hold against him, but I want to explain to you that when I read this book, and maybe you read it for yourself, that you have to understand that also Martin Luther was not perfect in his understanding, also not in his historic understanding. But of course, and that is something that I agree on, he draws a very important line here when he says that at the time of before Emperor Phocas and before Boniface III, the time of Emperor Maurice and the time of um, Gregory the Great, or Gregory I, St. Gregory as he calls him here, 
at that time, that church was still less devilish than it was after the time when Phocas gave the power to Boniface III. Because St. Gregory warned that whenever a bishop calls, starts to call himself universal bishop, he is the precursor of Antichrist. Now, forget the word precursor, he is Antichrist. Point. That's what the Bishop of Rome, Gregory, or St. Gregory, as Luther calls him, says. Okay? With that line, of course, I agree. So I don't want to discuss Luther. I just want to make the point that you can understand it as it should really be meant that even that church that Gregory was a representative of was already an apostate church. It only became more apostate with then Boniface III who followed him up and he called himself for the very first time Universal Bishop or Pontifex Maximus. Okay? So, I'm going to repeat this very last uh, paragraph on page 297 before we're going to continue on the next page. And now, try to understand what I read right now in, in the mindset what I just explained to you about being apostate. Okay? And if one had at that time asked Emperor Phocas if it were his opinion that his command should establish such trash in Rome, who subjects all bishops, institutions and churches under his own control, tears up and devours everything there is, establishes new faith and doctrine, destroys Christ and Christian faith, institutes innumerable idolatries, thoroughly cheats the whole world and defrauds it with great treachery of vast sums of money and property, who then tramples on emperors and bands, slays and persecutes them, who robs them of their lands and towns, while he ridicules them as his fools and laughs up his sleeves, <laughs> who devours their wealth and spends it with his horse and hermaphrodites. Do you think that Phocas, no matter how wicked he is, would he say yes to this? Indeed, perhaps he would so deal with them that they would no longer speak of the papacy and would forget about it. Yes, think this is what happens, and this is how it must happen when one paints the devil above the door and asks him to be Godfather. Huh? When you invite the devil, he will come in. Is it difficult enough to have it end as uh, to have it end well, as Peter says, the righteous man is scarcely saved, when one blesses oneself in God's name before the devil and begins a thing of prayer? But what should it be and become when one begins a thing in the devil's name and against God's will? Then doors and windows are opened wide for the devil to blow in with all his might. Now then. The Pope has begun his papacy in the name of the devil, and not Christ, and with all kinds of lies and blasphemy, and has dragged the papacy down to the hellish dregs of every kind of depravity and disgrace, all of which we can see in Rome in broad daylight. We can recognize what kind of tree it is, and who planted it by its fruits. For these fruits I have told of Proof of, uh, I have told of proof that the papal horror did not come from God and was not started in God's name, but was instituted by the devil through God's wrath and punishment for sins, and in his name entered the church. And so shall I go on proving it. We still have a few pages left in this book, and Martin Luther Martin Luther will convince us all by scripture that he holds point here. First, he says, by proper division. And to start at the bottom, 
it was not instituted by the temporal authority, and even if it had been, it would have been from the devil. Now, let me just go into a second here. I said earlier already that the Pope claims that he has his authority from the temporal authority, and now Luther says, no, it's not. And even if it had been, it would still have been from the devil. Why? We will learn in an instant. But here you see that what I'm reading to you now, Martin Luther confirms what I said earlier. The Pope, one, does not have the power from temporal authority. Secondly, he does not have the power from spiritual authority. He does not have any power. So, the reason is this. I'm going to repeat the first sentence so we can better get into it. First, by proper division, and to start at the bottom, it was not instituted by the temporal authority, and even if it had been, it would still have been from the devil. The reason is this. Temporal authority does not have the power to do this in the kingdom of God. As <laughs> simple as that. Thus, we have uh, thus we heard above and therefore we can go back to page 277 which I'm going to do in a, in a second here uh, when Martin Luther says we had heard above on page two, uh, 277 there it says quote from that page in summary they are all the creatures uh, the popes and heirs of the Emperor Phocas, who first established the papacy in Rome and whom they loyally follow. Okay? This is what is written on page 277. This is why this little footnote um, leads up there. Thus we heard above that it was truly not the intention of Emperor Phocas to establish a power like this in the church, and he cannot do it either. Perhaps he meant the Bishop of Rome to be solely a superintendent who would for God's sake, watch over the life and doctrine of the Church, as he had been ordered by the Nicene Council. For it is impossible to watch over the life and teaching of all the churches and bishops in the whole world. In summary, the Pope himself cannot tolerate the fact that he should have it, the papacy, from the Emperor. Instead, emperors and kings should have their crowns and kingdoms from him. This is one point and note it well. The papacy is not from the emperor and cannot come from the emperor, nor does the pope want to have it from him. Now, second, the papacy did not come from spiritual powers either, that is, from Christianity and bishops in the whole world, or from the councils. They neither are able nor do they have authority to create the papacy. Indeed, when one really studies the histories, one finds not one bishop or church in all the world that has willingly accepted the Pope, but rather, almost all the bishops and churches struggled and fought against it, just as until the present day the bishops and churches in the whole Orient have not acknowledged the Pope and still do not acknowledge him. Therefore he blasphemes and lies grossly that God set him over all the churches in the whole world, which God never said or did and does not intend to do. And thus he makes a liar out of God and heretics out of all the churches through his evil spirit that rages in him against God, his Holy Spirit and his church. Even when there were still bishops in Rome, before the Pope, the Antichrist, was thrown there by the devil, the Nicene Council entrusted the Bishop of Rome with the care of the churches near Rome, but did not make him a Pope, and did not give him ruling authority over some of the churches, and certainly not over all of the churches. Thus, we have heard above that the papacy did not exist before Emperor Phocas and Boniface III, and the churches and the whole world knew nothing of it. St. Gregory, pious Christian bishop of the Roman Church, condemned it 
and would not tolerate it at all. Here I'm going to stop the reading for today. We'll probably go back this little paragraph next time when we start the reading. But we have reached about an hour and I think it was quite hard stuff and you all have to do a little bit of your own research to get in full agreement with everything that I read and everything that I commented on here. It is vitally important for everybody to do his own research and only believe that what you have learned by finding out of yourself, by studying the Bible and by studying real most of the time omitted history. Find the sources, find the books, and study it. I found it, you can find it too. And only the truth that you discover for yourself is the truth that you really believe. I can preach and talk here in my videos until the cows come home. If you don't find that out and confirm that for yourselves, you will never accept it. And to be vigilant and to be suspicious and to question everything is okay. The truth does not fear investigation. And I am telling you the truth with what I read here today in this last hour of the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Martin Luther, written and published in 1545. Until next time, Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, says God bless you, signing off and bye bye. <laughs>